Uh, hi everyone, thanks for showing up to listen to my talk. Uh, my name is Daniel, I work at Facebook on a team called Kernel Applications. Uh, <laughs> the charter of our team is to pretty much make the Linux kernel more usable from the user space side of things. And so one of the projects I work on is UMD. Uh, I want to apologize in advance if I sound kind of weird, my throat feels a little funny, so if I need to like cough, that's probably why. Uh, so what is UMD? So UMD is a user space out of memory killer. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about what, what an UMD killer is, if, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with that. Uh, so UMD lives in user space. It's also mostly dependency free. And when I say dependency free, I mean once if you have a static binary and it's running, you don't really need any other system services to be available. All you really need is the latest, uh, latest Linux kernel. And when I say latest, I also mean you need really latest and then some special patches that Facebook's Johannes has created. But I think the patches are going to be upstream pretty soon, so uh, in a couple months you should be able to just pull the latest upstream kernel and things should be fine. Uh, UMD, I posit, is deterministic, faster, and more flexible than the kernel UMD killer, and I'll talk about that in some later slides as well. UMD is also open source. It's licensed under GPL2. You can view the code on the first link, and then you can read the very nice documentation that a guy named Thomas from Facebook wrote on the second link. So uh, the agenda for this talk, it's fairly short, actually. Uh, I'm going to go over the motivation mechanism and then results behind UMD, and then I'll leave some time at the end for questions. And if no one has questions, you can get some of your day back. So motivation. So why create UMD? Uh, so first, I think we need to back up a little bit and go over why UMD scenarios actually happen. So on most Linux hosts, you typically overcommit memory, and overcommitting memory pretty much means that memory allocations do not fail. Uh, sometimes it can fail, depending on how you have configured memory overcommit. The thinking behind memory overcommit is that most applications that allocate memory don't necessarily use all of the memory that they allocate. The classic example is uh, sparse arrays. So an application might uh, allocate a bunch of memory for a, a big array, and then not actually fill up all the entries in, the, in that array. However, just because the kernel returns you a pointer, not a null pointer, doesn't mean the memory is always available. So if the system actually runs out of physical memory, something has to happen. The kernel will typically try to free up some pages that it can. For example, it'll try to flush any dirty pages in the page cache, or it'll try to swap some anonymous memory out to swap. But if that fails, the kernel has to come and do something. And that usually means it'll go pick a process, usually the biggest one, and just kill it. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can configure uh, kernel loom killing. One of them is, or I've listed a few of them. Uh, there's a bunch of procfs things that you can turn uh, to tell the kernel what to kill in an, an oom. Personally, I think it's a little bit confusing. Uh, the knobs there are all pretty much numbers. I think some of them go from like negative 16 to 15 to positive 15. Some of them go from 0 to 1,000. Uh, in my opinion, it's not very intuitive, but if you are reading the oom underscore kill dot c file in the Linux source tree, I think it makes a good deal of sense, but that's only if you know the implementation. So from the user side of things, it's, I don't think it's very ergonomic, and I think there could be a better way to do it. Uh, the kernel loom killer is also pretty slow to act. Uh, if you're here for Tejan and Johannes' resource control at Facebook talk, they alluded to this uh, somewhat briefly. By the time the kernel loom killer actually kicks in, things are already probably too late for user space. That's uh, usually because the kernel loom killer tries to protect kernel health. Uh, so it doesn't really care too much about what user space is doing so long as the kernel is making forward progress. One thing that we have seen at Facebook is that so under heavy memory pressure, the kernel will execute some instructions. It'll try to fault in on a memory page to access some memory. And then after that instruction is done, it'll fault out that memory page and fault back in the code page. And then it kind of just repeats over and over. So an operation that could, usually doesn't take that much time starts taking like five to ten minutes. And then all the while, user space is live locked and your application health has died. The kernel also doesn't have any good context into the logical composition of a system. So for example, there could be two processes on a system that you really don't want killed. Uh, so you really want to kill at the same time. So for example, if one dies, the other really should be dead because it doesn't do anything else without the first one. Or there might be another case where two processes should never be killed at the same time. So one process should always be alive and the other should always be dead or something. It's hard to tell the kernel to do this. Uh, There's also not a really great way to customize kill actions. You can't really say, hey, I don't actually want you to sig kill or sig term something. I want you to send an RPC or I want you to send some kind of notification. For example, to like Docker D, you don't actually want to kill Docker D. You want Docker D to start reaping containers. 
Uh, there's no great way to do that other than using something like Event FD, but again, that falls in the first thing I mentioned where it's, uh, the kernel's pretty uh, slow in reacting to these kind of scenarios. Uh, it's also, the kernel killer is also somewhat non-deterministic. You have to turn all the knobs in procfs. It's not to say it's impossible to get it right, but if you have a service that forks a lot of processes off, you're kind of racing against the system to set the correct oom adjust knobs or whatnot. So oom problems at Facebook. Facebook actually runs into a bunch of out-of-memory problems. Uh, I've listed some of them off here. One of the platforms that suffers uh, out-of-memory issues is our build and test platform that we call Sandcastle. So Sandcastle, essentially every time a Facebook developer uploads some code to be uh, reviewed, Sandcastle will build and test that code. And Sandcastle typically co-locates these build jobs onto a small group of shared hosts. Building arbitrary, not really arbitrary, but like building code can sometimes lead to issues because you know linking takes a lot of memory. Plus, if you build everything in tempfs, which Sandcastle does happen to do, uh, it can eat up a lot of memory. And so bugs and accidents do happen. <coughs> and when they do, you can oom a box. And ideally, you don't want to take down the whole box for an extended period of time. Uh, we also have a container and service platform called Tupperware, where developers and operators of services can run containers, much like Kubernetes. Bugs do happen, memory leaks happen. And if you use a shared pool of hardware, you don't really want to take out your neighbors because one developer from one service had a somewhat nasty bug. We also have a somewhat more esoteric environment. We have a commodity top of rack switches that we call FBOSS. It's a very resource constrained environment. The boxes only have eight gigs of RAM. And so it's really easy to oom the box, actually. So for example, if Chef comes along and runs an update, it'll do a bunch of IO, it'll use a bunch of memory. And then maybe another package update happens uh, in the at the same time asynchronously. And then maybe the rack switch is serving a lot of traffic. It's really easy for the box to run on memory. And in these cases, you don't want the host to lock up or freeze because you'll take down a whole rack, uh, or the networking for an entire rack. So you'd like to gracefully shut down some things, such as Chef or the package update. And pretty much mo most multi-platform, uh, multi-tenant platforms suffer from out-of-memory issues because bugs and mistakes do happen. A lot of these platforms cho choose to turn on panic on OOM because in these scenarios, you don't want something non-deterministic. For example, if you're running uh, again, go back to the example of Docker. You don't want to accidentally kill the management daemon and let the tasks or containers run without any management uh, oversight. That could lead to some pretty nasty bugs. So some of these services, they'll turn panic on OOM. So if the host runs out of memory, it'll shut down the entire box, and then these containers will get re uh, reassigned to another box somewhere else. While this is logically pretty correct, it's suboptimal in that it wastes resources. There's just servers and data center spinning rebooting and not really doing much else, so there could be a better solution. Uh, UMD is also used for FP tax too. Uh, Tejan and Johannes talked about it uh, briefly in their earlier talk, if you weren't here to see it. The summary is that they want full work conserving OS resource isolation across applications. In short, it means two workloads should be able to coexist on a machine. If one starts doing bad things, the other one shouldn't really be affected. And an UMD plays a part in rectifying these uh, pathological cases where the kernel isn't able to protect everything. There's a bunch of links at the bottom if you want to check it out later. Uh, a lot of cool stuff going on there. So moving on to mechanisms. So how does UMD actually work? So UMD heavily leverages a new kernel feature called PSI that Johannes wrote. And essentially what PSI tells you is it gives you a number between 0 and 100 that tells you how much wall clock time you have lost due to resource shortages. If, you, if it says zero, it means you have not lost any wall clock time. That means your workload should be theoretically healthy, barring any bugs you may have introduced yourself. 100 means you're not making any forward progress, and something is terribly wrong with resources on your system. So UMD monitors or keeps like a time series of the memory pressure or I/O pressure, and then if the uh, if, if there's like if it's trending upwards or trending really high, it'll start performing correcting actions. At the core of UMD is the plugin system. So that means uh, it's, it's designed so that people can customize detection and kill actions. Uh, we provide a default UM detector and UM killer plugin that is pretty sensible and works across a variety of platforms. We deployed it to a bunch of uh, tiers, and they work really great out of the box. If you want to change it, you can subclass these plugins and then override the methods you want. Pretty standard behavior. Uh, UMD doesn't just monitor memory either, it also monitors I.O. pressure, and that's because PSI actually covers I.O. pressure as well. UMD also monitors swap, because swap is pretty essential for UMD to have enough runway to detect building memory pressure, because if you don't have swap, an honest memory tends to be M-locked into memory, and then you could very suddenly uh, spike from 0 to 100 uh, in memory pressure really quickly. 
So this is the original UMD config, and that's what we're running with in production these days. Uh, as you can see, it's mostly just JSON. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, so we're monitoring system.slice, we're monitoring the pretty non-essential system services. And we have a kill list, which is uh, in order. So what it says is if, sh if uh, the host ooms, if chef is using more than 1,000 megabytes of memory, please kill chef. And then never kill SSHD, because you don't want to lose SSH, uh, SSH access. And then we're using the default oom detector and oom killer plugins. If you had custom plugins, that you would put the custom plugins name in there. Uh, so the UMD as it currently exists works pretty well. Uh, we have in production in a bunch of places and helps prevent a lot of really bad pathological cases when a host runs out of memory. However, as we've onboarded more and more customers and experienced different use cases, it's become apparent that we need to iterate on UMD. So we're changing the config file language. We can cha we're changing how the thing works in the back end. Uh, we're still iterating and playing around with the details, but I think we're on to something really nice here, and it works really great in helping protect hosts from ooms. What I have here is the umd2 config. Uh, this is the next iteration on the config. Uh, it's mostly pseudocode here. I've circled the pseudocode in a yellow box. What this is essentially saying is that if the workload slows down by more than 5%, or if system.slice slows down by more than 40%, please kill something that hogs a lot of memory in system.slice. So in other words, if your workload experiences a little bit of slowdown, please do something about it. If the non-essential stuff experiences a good amount of slowdown, it doesn't really matter to us so as long as the workload is healthy. Uh, I'm going to flash by to the actual config. This is the actual config that would work. I'm not going to put it up because then you'll just squint at it. Uh, it's not really important because what it essentially says is what I have outlined here. Uh, you might have noticed that the actual config is pretty long and verbose. That's because this umd2 config isn't necessarily meant to be written by end users uh, frequently. It's designed for, with two use cases in mind. The first use case is that a workload-aware application, such as the um, orchestration layer of our, or the control plane of a container platform, it would dynamically generate these umd2 configs such that it protects the workload as best it can. And the second use case is, say, you're not running a shared uh, multi-tenant service, you're running a single platform thing with your custom software on bare metal. Uh, and one operator might sit down for a couple days and write a config that works well across all these machines. And then, so you really don't need people uh, tweaking it every day. Uh, it's not really meant to be used by like desktop Linux users. For example, I wouldn't really put UMD on my personal machine as I don't really do things that oom my box other than sometimes build things that take too much memory to link. Uh, note that interesting implementation detail, not that it's super important because just details, is that there is an intermediate representation layer in UMD. So that means you're not, we're not fully locked into JSON here. We could theoretically spend a couple hours and add in a YAML interface or TOML or maybe an IP tables-like interface where you can have a config all in one line. Super uh, concise. Uh, so results, so how well does UMD actually work? So here we have a graph of memory usage over time on a single host. And this is a host from one of our build and test. Uh, uh, it's just in our build and test fleet for Sandcastle. It's one of the hosts. So you can see at some point a build starts, and then the memory usage spikes really high. And then at another point, the memory usage dips really fast. The dip is because UMD came and decided to kill something because it detected memory pressure was too high. And so prevented the box from being locked up for an extended period of time and then essentially not being utilized. Uh, you might notice, for those who are very perceptive, the y-axis is missing uh, labels and units. That's because the lawyer said I couldn't have numbers. Uh, yeah, but I'm sure you can figure out what this means. This is another graph of the panic on OOM rate before and after an OOMD rollout. So you'll notice again the y-axis doesn't have numbers, and this makes probably more sense as we don't want to expose. Or I'm not allowed to expose how many hosts we have running this kind of stuff. But you can see that the rate at which hosts panic on OOM kind of dipped pretty significantly at a certain point in time, and that's when an UMD rollout uh, occurred. And it was 8 AM on a Friday, so it was like, you have a full day to figure it out if there's bugs. Uh, so yeah, there's time for questions if anyone has any. Otherwise, you get some of your day back. Yeah? Uh, do we need the mic? In one of your first slides, you mentioned ButterFS. Does it require ButterFS, or can you use it without it? Uh, you do not need ButterFS now. Yeah, it should be file system agnostic, barring like prior to your inversions that we've hit. Yeah, one of the interesting bugs was the MAP SEM thing. It's like it would it, it put uh, processes into uninterruptible sleep. 
under high memory pressure because it holds the MFSM and tries to do the read ahead thing. And then even though UMD tries to stick kill it, it just won't die because it's stuck doing IO, which is kind of nasty. But I think it's been fixed, yeah. All right, awesome.